This review is sponsored by Gasoline. <laughs> Sick of your electric car dying in the middle of nowhere? Go with gas. It only destroys the environment a part of the way. What's up everyone? I am the Kaiji no Kami and today I'm going to be taking a look at Ultraman Tiga that was recently released on DVD from Mill Creek. After the abysmal directionless Ultraman 80, Tsuburaya had put Ultraman to rest with a few international attempts here or there before bringing the franchise back to Japanese airwaves for its 30th anniversary in 1996. Like with the original show in 7, Tiga was set in the not too distant future where mankind has moved on from warring with itself and ventured into space and beyond in the name of peace. Of course, the only thing Tiga was successful in being accurate with is that in 2010, we were still eating at Subway restaurants. Beyond that, we still don't have the technology that Tiga promised, and we're 11 years past that show. Anyway, Ultraman Tiga was such a huge success that it reignited Japan's love for the Ultra series, which has been going on almost non-stop ever since outside of a few years break due to bankruptcy issues. Tiga was even brought to American television, originally released by 4Kids Entertainment and aired on the Foxbox programming block. To say the dub was downright awful is an understatement. Headquarters, come in please. Hello? Anybody home? What is it? Something's descending into the atmosphere. Could you be any more vague? Perhaps Santa Claus came early. And that's enough of that. Let us never speak of that dub again. Or that version, especially that awful opening theme. Oh. Is Ultraman Tiga a resounding success? Or should they have kept the series on ice for a little bit longer? Let's find out. The heroes. Our lead hero is Daigo Madoka, half human, half warrior of light given that he can transform into Ultraman Tiga. Daigo initially joined the Terrestrial Peaceable Consortium, or TPC, to be a part of their transportation division. His brave actions to save TPC's founder from an alien abduction initiated him into being recruited for TPC's specialty squad that deals with monsters and alien invasions known as the Global Unlimited Task Squad. Guts, for short. At the start of the series, the TPC recovers an ancient device containing the hologram of a woman named Yuzere, who warns them that her civilization was destroyed by a great darkness, and that the modern world would once again be privy to this assault that would kickstart through a series of monster attacks. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Through this, a pyramid containing three statues of giants is uncovered, one of which gives Daigo a device called a spark lens that allows him to transform into Ultraman Tiga. Hiroshi Nagano does a spectacular job portraying Daigo as the hero he is supposed to be, while also showing him conflicted from time to time as he is unsure if he is truly worthy of being the world's protector. It also stresses him out as he believes he must defend the world alone and hides his alternate persona from his cohorts. <laughs> Daigo is also a terrible pilot who gets shot down so much it started to become a running gag. Daigo? What? Shinjo! Daigo! Dashu! Mataka! Shotoki! Mata? As for Ultraman Tiga, Daigo has access to a wide array of abilities and skills that can handle almost any threat. For a first time in the franchise's history, Tiga can change his forms to suit his needs. His base form, known as Multi-Type, is a striking purple and red form that balances speed and strength together. If he faces foes that are stronger than he is, his body will shift to being all red, increasing his power.
When he needs to focus on agility, he will turn all purple to signify such. I love the purple, red, and silver design as it just pops on screen. Another aspect of Tiga I like is that he can fight human-sized a la Ultra 7. Therefore, we will occasionally see him tussle with monsters that are not gigantic. Another nice feature is Tika will sometimes lose a battle, something 80 failed to do, which took away from the tension after a while. Like in this scene for example, the vampire monster is pretty much unstoppable and Tika loses to him. It then takes both a journalist and guts to take out this vampire in order to allow Tiga to survive and finish the monster off. Say cheese! That was a nice change of pace because not only did you actually get to see guts be competent, but it also shows that Tiga needs their help instead of it always being Tiga saves them. Aiden Daigo in his quest to save the world is the rest of the Guts team, all of whom have at least two episodes to themselves to shine. It also helps that they are all competent soldiers. The team definitely lives up to their name as they all have a lot of guts. Kicking off the roster is Daigo's love interest, the ace pilot Reina Yanase. Reina is the first of two strong female leads whose feelings for Daigo progress as the show does. She's a kind-hearted soul who would prefer to keep monsters alive than outright murder them, but knows that may not be possible. Kritawa. Another trait is she takes her job seriously is seen in one instance when a fellow team member tried to pull off his inner attack persona. Her father is also a member of the TPC, though she disdains the man for he put his duty over his family, even when her mother was on death's door. After Rena comes Guts' hot-headed expert marksman, Tetsuo Shinjo, whose name is based on the head writer for the original three Ultra shows, Tetsuo Kinjo. Shinjo loves to jump into a situation without assessing it first, which is also why he tends to be shot down, especially when Daigo is his co-pilot. Shinjo has a sister named Mayumi, who works at the TPC as a nurse, which also means she has to treat her brother quite a lot whenever he is injured, a task she takes no pleasure in. <laughs> Shinjo's also afraid of ghosts, and can't handle something as simple as a haunted house. Masumi Hori is the team's lead scientist who invents whatever type of device or weapon is needed to serve the episode's plot. Hori goes through a lot of crap throughout the show, as his mentor is killed, a group of scientists he idolizes die, as does one of his friends from college, and yet he never lets his positivity falter. It's a tad refreshing, although sometimes they do kind of fat shame him. Hori's probably all like, uh, thanks? I think? He also hits his head in one scene, which makes you wonder, was it scripted or was that on accident and it was just so well done they decided to keep it in there? <laughs> Hori 
コンピューターソフトでまず頭角を現して今は宇宙開発の主力企業 Next up is the youngest member of the team, the 15 year old Jun Yazumi. Yazumi spends a lot of his time behind a computer console, for he's often the one who studies weird encounters to deduce a solution to them. He's a brash individual who finds himself quite nervous the first time he has to assist on the battlefield, to the point where he even gets into an argument with Mayumi about death. ななね、It's also apparent that he is an expert gamer, for he wins a video game contest that allows him to visit the software company behind it, only to find himself fighting inside of a realistic game and dealing with an AI named Karen. Sounds about right. These four key players are portrayed by Takami Yashimoto, Shigeki Kagamaru, Yukio Masuda, and Yoichi Furuya. Yoshimoto has recently been featured in Ultraman X and Ultraman Trigger, while Kagamaru is in the 94 Ultra 7 duo. Seishi Munakata is Guts' field team leader and second in command of the organization. Munakata is a straight edge soldier who goes to bars and drinks only milk as he wants to ensure he is never plastered when the Call of Duty arises. Brande. ミルクにしといた方がそんな固いこと言ってるからいつまでたっても一人なのよ Apparently, this is actually because actor Akitoshi Otaki does not drink alcohol either, so they carried this aspect over to his character. Munakata learned to be cool headed and relaxed from Guts' captain Megumi Uruma, who had saved him from certain doom before the TPC existed. Speaking of Uruma, as stated, she is the captain of Guts. Mio Takaki plays a strong willed individual who is willing to think outside of the box when it comes to an operation. Iruma is also the first person in Guts to accept that Ultraman Tiga is a friend of humanity and openly states such on national television without the approval of the executives who run Guts. <laughs> Sadly, Iruma's husband had died while she was on an operation overseas, which strained her relationship with her son and mother in law. Even more interesting is that her son appears to be a resilient A class hacker who knows how to hijack an entire city's power grid to help Tiga in a time of need. <laughs> She also went to school with the Dark Knight Kiba. Rounding out the cast are the officers who run the TPC, which includes its founder Soichiro Sawai. Before the TPC, the world was protected by a country based defense force who sought to build as many weapons as possible to protect their own individual country. Sawai ventured across the world to bring every nation together as one, which is how the formation of the TPC occurred. <laughs> Regretfully, events in Tiga start to see other nations wanting to have their own version of Guts installed as opposed to relying on a centralized team, which frustrates Iruma immensely. So why is a kind-hearted man who always tries to see the positives over the negatives, and he is the reason Daigo became a part of Guts. Opposing Sawai is the man in charge of the military side of operations, Tetsuji Yoshioka. Yoshioka is hot headed and tends to come across as a complete and utter asshole, only for there to be moments where you see he is actually a human being, just an intensely passionate one. I'm not sure if you're a 
We are also shown that even the TPC has its own set of shady officers. Guts's vehicle equipment includes the standard Ultraman cars and ships. The first batch of them are colored yellow and are easily recognizable when traveling across Japan. In the last third of the series, Guts receives a new batch of ships that are red in color, along with a flying battleship that makes me think of something you would see from a Gundam series. One of the things I like about Tiga is in the second episode we actually get to see the Gutswing being reconfigured for combat against monsters as they were initially just vehicles to travel from one location to the next with ease. It adds a sense of realism to the show you don't normally expect. The Monsters and Aliens Being that it is an ultra show, there has to be a lot of interesting monsters and aliens, right? That would be correct. One of Tiga's strong points is that there is not a single reused alien or monster to be found here. Every creature is a brand new being, some of which have never been seen since this show, which is a true crime. Now, some of them do have traits similar to those of the past, as one of Tiga's starter monsters, Goza, is clearly this show's equivalent to Gomera. With that said, there are so many amazing creatures to talk about that I'm not even sure where to start. I guess I should also mention that one of Tiga's strong points is how several of these critters may appear more than once, as Tiga loves to revisit and add additional mythos on earlier plot lines. For example, there are a bunch of carnivorous creatures that live in the clouds known as Clitters, who are mutated by magnetic radiation and show up three times across its entirety. <laughs> Another race of aliens known as the Kyriel, who take up the bodies of dead people, have two episodes to their name and then also make a brief appearance in the finale. I'll swallow your soul! There's an undead monster whose body seems to be made of toxic waste. Next up are a group of crow men who shrink people to take home with them known as the Raybeak. Sounds similar to what the Dada do, don't they? <laughs> There's Leylands. A witch who kidnaps children in Halloween and eats their dreams called Girambo. <laughs> Sukuna Oni, who is a demon that was chopped into pieces centuries ago by a lone samurai. A wicked fog monster that allows the show to make a Stephen King reference. We've got a yokai named Obiku, played by the spectacular Shoichiro Akaboshi, whom you all should know by now as Magnet Priest and Die Ranger, Kappa and Kaka Ranger, Professor Hena and O Ranger, and the Black Star Commander and Ultraman Orb. And that's not even counting his voice work in the likes of Hunter x Hunter, Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexo, Junji Ito Collection, and Ice Shield. Following that is a giant vampire god who also has his own army of women wearing sunglasses at night. A giant shark creature that is okay with me for he destroys a golf course. Oh no, won't someone please think of the golfers? 
Robot Menaces. A reference to Charlie Chan. Charlie Chan. <laughs> and red versus blue. <laughs> the effects and music. First and foremost, I need to talk about the elephant in the room. The show's proper opening theme, Take Me Higher, is not present on this DVD. Well, kind of. I'll get more into detail on that when I cover the DVD section. The agency who provided Take Me Higher, Johnny and Associates, has decided to become the biggest pieces of shit imaginable and won't allow Superaya to license the song outside of Japan despite it not being an issue back in the early 2000s when Funimation had released Tiga on DVD. I have no idea as to exactly why beyond speculation, but regardless, it is utter and complete bullshit that any company would allow this joke of the industry control them. Even Sega has recently been having issues with these dipshits when it comes to the Yakuza spin-off series Judgment. Now, it isn't the first time I've dealt with a show that has had its music changed, as it has happened before in the anime industry, specifically with The Big O. For some reason, the opening songs to The Big O had to be changed when the show was released in high definition, which also saw even the music being altered within the show itself. I just don't get why these companies have such an issue with their music rights, and it has to stop. As far as I'm concerned, Johnny and Associates are nothing more than entertainment terrorists who will intentionally sabotage a production they were involved in just to get their way, and this is apparently a company that has the power to blacklist production companies if they so choose. I think it's high time Japanese companies grow some balls and tell Johnny and Associates this. Fuck off! You guys should be lucky companies want to use your employees, not the other way around. It's time you fucktards come into the 21st century and learn your place. There, I've said my piece on this, so it's time to move on. Well, after one more. Johnny and Associates, go fuck yourselves. Anyway, as I said, the proper opening to Ultraman Tiga is the song Take Me Higher by V6. And it is a damn good song. It's very energetic, has a rhythmic techno tone to it, and is very catchy. It's easily one of the best opening themes to any Ultraman show. Now with that in mind, once I got used to the opening fun on this DVD set, Voyager's Awaken Ultraman Tiga, I started to find myself enjoying it quite a bit. It works as an opening song, however, there are no credits displayed during the song and the visuals shown are just various clips from the show itself, which makes us feel as if it were just someone's AMV they did for YouTube. I just don't get why they didn't show the opening credits that were created for Take Me Higher, but have this song over it. Or create new credits if they needed to. Thankfully, the closing song, Brave Love, Tiga, is freaking phenomenal. Earth Protection Force provides what is easily one of the best ending themes out there in the realms of Toku. It's even more catchy than Take Me Higher is, which is saying a lot if you know how often I tend to loathe ending theme songs. Although, it's not exactly effective in pulling me out of the mood of the show, because every time I hear it, I want to watch more. As for Tatsumi Yano's score for the remainder of the show, it is pure excellence. Just like with the openings and closing, the music enhances everything that is happening on screen, keeping me engaged with every waking minute of it. Yano is no stranger to Toku, for he has done work on several Sentai series, such as Live Man, Changeman, and Bioman.
Now that my extensive random raves about the music is done and over with, let's talk about the effects work, which is... Uh, hit or miss? It's amazing no one was hurt. Bye, everybody. Uh. Subaraya decided to test out the capabilities of CGI and green screen for much of this show, and not all of it has aged well. It was an ambitious test, however, so I give it some leeway for its effectiveness, even though it isn't always successful. There are some truly cringeworthy moments, specifically during flying battles. Yazumi has an episode where he is fighting in a video game-esque world with less than stellar results. I'm not sure if they were intentionally supposed to be that bad, but damn is that awful looking. Almost as bad as the backgrounds in Zenkaiger. Thankfully, the story and characters are so engaging that the poor effects are easy to ignore. The miniature work is exceptional more often than not, with a lot of truly fantastic sets for Tiga and his foes to battle on. Camera work is just as glamorous, with some episodes featuring some truly outstanding shots, angles, atmosphere, and filters to enhance the mood of mystery. A couple episodes in particular were directed by Akio Jisoji, who helmed some of the fan favorites of the Showa era like Ultra 7's superb Metron episode, and his signature style is all over the duo. The episodes. In something of a rarity, there was not a single episode I downright hated. In fact, even my least favorite episode is not that bad of an episode. It's just that it doesn't live up to the standards the rest of the show entails. And that episode is episode 24's GO! Monster Expedition Squad, or as I call it, the Goonies Meet Ultraman. Daigo and Hori are on patrol when they become victims to a group of kids prank. The kids laugh at their fun only to find themselves confronted by a monster with no one in town believing what they saw due to their notoriety. It's one of the few episodes to revolve around a group of kids and the tone just feels out of place compared to the rest of the show, especially when the little girl of the group accidentally blows up a part of a billboard in the guts car. <laughs> And we get a scene like this following that event. The monster itself is kind of cool and feels a bit reminiscent to Twin Tail in design. Again, it's not terrible by any means, just not up to par with those around it. My favorite episode was a tough one to choose because there are so many spectacular masterpieces. It also helps that there is a lot of continuity to be had, some of which will include something as simple as injuries being carried over into the next episode, as we saw with Daigo when he injured his arm in a plane crash, along with Shinjo's leg. Shinjo time. <laughs> We've got one that was written by Shozu Uhara, which acts as a tribute to Eiji Tsuburaya. 
つぶらえ知らないのか俺は夢中になってみたゴジラモスラいやすごい迫力だった The episodes with the Ray Beak, Obiko, the Killer Fog, Vampires, and of course, the tale that is set on Halloween. The one that I had to go with is naturally one of the episodes directed by Jisoji titled Flower. Flower kicks off with the Guts team bored because nothing has happened over the last month. They go on a picnic, which results in Aruma being kidnapped by a pair of aliens who look like statues. The show is full of extraordinary camera work, a distortion filter that gives off an illusionary feel as if you don't know the difference between reality and fantasy. And a very stylish fight with Tiga with superb music. We also get to see Tiga fight human size for a moment again as he rescues Aruma. The movie and special. Sadly, once again, thanks to Johnny and Associates, the movie could not be included on this set while the special is. The Final Odyssey is a theatrical film that takes place two years after the events of the series. It kicks off with the TPC exploring the island of Relay and discovering a trio of stone giants. The stone giants awaken, revealing themselves to be three evil beings named Carmera, Hudra, and Daram. Apparently, Tiga used to be one of them and Kamara was Tiga's ultra-ancient ex-girlfriend who he dumped when he turned to the side of good. Overall, the movie is average at best and nowhere near the same level as the TV series. Stuff happens, the three dark giants all obtain human forms that look like they stepped out of Kamen Rider Kuga. <laughs> Iruma is reckoned into being the reincarnation of Yuzure. Guts has to be assisted by the Rogue Squadron. Red 3 standing by. Red 6 standing by. Red 9 standing by. Red 2 standing by. And Tiga gains an upgrade form for the final fight. Wait. Three dark giants. Tiga used to be the fourth member of them before becoming good. One was in love with Tiga. One of the female members of Guts is the reincarnation of Yuzure. And Glitter Power. Oh my god! Ultraman Trigger is just the final odyssey with filler! I did like how we come to learn that Tiga acquired his speed and strength, color forms from Hudra and Duram. On the other hand, I am not a fan of the show retconning Aruma into being the reincarnation of Yuzure, when this aspect was never explored at all during the show itself. Also, I have to say I find it laughable that the whole reason this movie could not be licensed in the US is because Take Me Higher is played during the credits. Why didn't they just change the end credit song to the song they used for the opening of the series on this DVD set? 
Once again, it doesn't make any sense. The special, which is set three decades later and features Daigo's son, Sabasa, is utter dog crap. Man, this thing is so freaking boring to sit through. Sabasa gets caught in a time loop that sends him 5,000 years into the past. There, he meets some primitives who are under attack by some Sentai rejects. <laughs> He temporarily transforms into Tiga, only to find himself unworthy of the title, losing it to some child. And a lot of boring ass crap happens that is irrelevant because you're not going to give a damn about anything that is happening. Unless you need to watch everything related to Ultraman, there is no reason to waste your time with this mundane movie. The DVD. It's at least better than the Ultraman 80 DVD. It's kind of the same in that we have the slipcase. We have disc trays with the discs on them, but unlike 80, we have an actual booklet that's not paper thin. It shows Tiga's form, shows some of the gut stuff, and then we have the episode guide that actually shows the monsters featured in each episode. Video and audio are about as one can expect when you cram nine episodes onto a single DVD. The compression doesn't seem as bad as it was on the Ultraman 80 DVD. However, when the video is bad, it's downright atrocious, as seen here. Also, a few episodes look like they were ripped from a VHS tape, which is not good at all. ID There's also a lack of detail and backgrounds due to the video's softness. I've even done a slight comparison between the video quality of the DVD set with the video quality of the HD TV rips I have, both of which seem to have their own set of flaws. どうしたの今悲鳴が聞こえたような気がしたんだ悲鳴ちょっと止めてどっかで戦っていた大悟大悟どうした大悟隊員大悟隊員相手サーチをかけてはい悲鳴ありません海海にいます地球の守護神になる
The songs that aren't Take Me Higher are also subbed during fight scenes most of the time. Lastly, the video and subtitle quality for the Side Story special are atrocious. I can't tell if the compression of the special is just that bad, or if Tsuburaya gave Mill Creek what might as well have been an 8th generation VHS copy of the story, but it is unacceptable in how terrible it looks. It was already bad enough that the story itself was garbage. Adding in what may be one of the ugliest DV transfers imaginable is just an insult to the viewers, as it showed no one cared about this movie's presentation. There's also a missing line in the horrifically translated subtitles. In the end, Ultramantiga is a fantastic return to the franchise as Tsuburaya was at the top of their game. Every character, every episode is just so damn good that you kind of wish the show had been a little bit longer. Thus, Ultraman Tiga undoubtedly deserves a solid 5 out of 5 grown-ups in spandex. This is not a series to miss out on and any Toku fan should check this one out whether they're an Ultraman fan or not. Hell, it might even get you interested into the franchise. This is easily a top 10 Ultra show, if not top 5. I just wish that Tsuburaya and Mill Creek had given it the release it truly deserves. Shame on you guys for not doing that. Nevertheless, do not miss Ultraman Tiga. Until next time, bye. If you remember, the 80 DVD, the booklet was like this paper thin thing that was just like, oh, episodes, okay, cool. That was it. Well, this one is... Okay.